Well, good morning, everyone. I think this is going to be just a tremendous panel. I, I'm on Facebook, OK? And I thought that I was the, um, I only got on it about three months ago. And, and I figured I was the last person in the world. And now I certainly hope that I'm, I wasn't the last person in the world and that, that I'm not typical. Because in crisis situations, I mean, we've seen it around the world. We've seen how groups band together through social media. Uh, we've seen how solutions come about through social media, and uh, you know even the, the the Department of Homeland Security has a has an out there program that I know you've that I know you've seen in one venue or another. If you see something, say something, and the responsibilities of us as citizens to um, to 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 help the government to help identify things. We we heard a couple of speakers yesterday who said, you know, I I sure hope that somebody calls me and tells me about that. You know that. I, we can't be the watchdog. The government can't be the watchdog for everything. So, so we're going to learn a good bit about that, and we're going to learn about the issues um, that come up when it when you're balancing privacy and security and 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 uh, information exchange. And it's been it's been great for AFCA and for the for our Homeland Security Committee to watch all of these panels come together um, for the for this year's conference and 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 this one in particular. Has, has been an interesting one. And, and I just think that uh, we've got a great group uh, put together for you that, that represent a wide swath of, of uh, uh, social media experts, let's put it that way. And we have others who are listening in and who have offered their, their, um, their guidance, their information, and who want to know what comes out of this session. So again, we're going we're gonna to also be counting on your questions. Uh, that's sort of a social, not quite a social media kind of thing, but it's, it's a little bit different for, for AFCA. So, so be sure to keep those questions going. Uh, moderator today, it's, it's, my, it's my honor, it's my pleasure to be able to, to just introduce a, a great friend of the committee and the association and certainly of mine. And, and so Bruce Walker, who is the uh, Vice President for Homeland Security Civil Agencies, Regulatory Agencies in the international part of Northrop Grumman Corporation has worked hard with a number of our other committee members to put this one together. So let's have at it. Thank you very, very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. I think what we've done is create a scenario for this panel discussion that revolves around social media and, it's, and it, where it's headed and what, how you use it and, and what kinds of things are, are policy and, and process related issues that challenge uh, the use of this kind of a mechanism in emergency or, or crisis management kinds of scenarios. Um, I have a great panel with us today. Um, to, my, to my left is, is Chris Demarski. He is um, in the, associated with the digital strategy activity at DHS. Uh, to his left is Tom Timmon, who is the co-host of the uh, Federal Drive um, on WTOP. And uh, at the end of the table here is Alex Joel from um, the Civil Liberties and Protection Activity over at the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. What I thought we'd do this morning from a, from a panel perspective is, is obviously from a moderator perspective. I'm going to get out of the way as fast as I can. Uh, the challenge here for the, for the panelists is to give us some of their background and then a scene setter discussion around the kinds of things that, that motivate, drive the things that they see in their day-to-day -day operations. And then we'll go back and start a dialogue with um, questions I've prepared and some as they come in on the, on the monitor from the audience so we can have a little bit more interactive discussion since it's about social media. So with that, Chris, let me turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, I'm Chris Stolmarski again from the Department of Homeland Security Office of Public Affairs. Uh, I lead the social media program for the department. and. My background is in, in the private sector primarily. I've been with DHS for two years now, and I come out of the private sector PR and communications side with uh, doing a lot of political, nonprofit, and corporate work. Um, so what my real task is at DHS is sort of to bring social media into everything we do uh, on the communications side and basically say, hey, you know, millions of Americans are on these channels. Millions of Americans use these channels every day, and they are expecting that government is not just on there providing, you know, hey, we're doing this, hey, we're doing that, but really sort of timely information. You know, how can we 
during a crisis, during an emergency, give people the information they need because that's where you know, survey after survey shows more and more people are expecting to find it. Um, in the past year, we've really seen, or past couple years, I would say, we've really seen people um, at all levels of government starting to embrace it. We've, we see, you know, us at the federal level embracing it, and we really are starting to see people jumping beyond just pushing out sort of, you know, here's a press release, or here's, you know, uh, you know a fact sheet, or here is, you know, sort of a really long piece of information, really pushing concise, usable information. You know, whether it's during the you know, tornadoes we had last year where we saw the locals really after, you know, their bunch of, a lot of the infrastructure was knocked out, but they still had access to cell phones and mobile data connections. People were going online, organizing amongst themselves, and then the local government and, you know, FEMA and DHS and the federal government kind of came and also sort of joined that conversation. So people then knew, hey, there's this Facebook page where, you know, I know when the, where the shelters are, I can find the shelters. Hey, I might not need a shelter, but I need to find, where can I get water? Do they still have water at the Walmart? Do they not? And sort of those sort of conversations are happening online. And, you know, they, they will happen whether the government participates or not. So we really need to participate and give sort of the credible piece of information that, you know, only we as a government can give. So that's really where we're heading and sort of what we're doing. Okay, Tom Temin, I am host of the Federal Drive. It's actually WFED Federal News Radio. I wish it was WTOP. There, I would like to have their audience. But I do thank you all for coming back in the room because in between I thought there was nobody here and it was going to be worse than a Mitt Romney rally at Lyon Stadium. So <laughs> we have more people than that. Thank you for showing up. I've been following the federal market for 20 years now. Uh, first, as, as many of you know, I was editor of Government Computer News in Washington Technology for 15 years, and now I yak about all these things. It, it is nice to see an audience because you don't know if nobody's listening when you're on the radio, but now I can see if you're not listening, so it's really an advantage to be up here. I wanted to uh, cover a, just very briefly, a case history that I found through a Google search. Uh, but to show what I thought seemed like the state of the art in emergency communications via social media during not a national security incident, but a FEMA type event. And this is called Trial by Fire, the deployment of trusted digital volunteers in the 2011 Shadow Lake fire. This was a, a Northwest fire that uh, was caused by lightning. And just a few of the main points, this is a long report, and I'm not gonna read much of it, just a few points that I found, and I'm gonna give you what I thought are kind of the lessons learned for people embarking on this social media uh, area of which I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical, to be honest with you. I think the most important social medium we have is, is the human voice and the human interaction. So that's always gonna be part of this. But um, this report, it's a scholarly, three professors wrote it up after the fact. It said, the pressure is placed on emergency managers to use these communication channels and citizens have high expectations that the public sector will use them, in fact. And so that was the, one of the most telling points. Uh, it said one uh, recent innovation was in this case, they uh, used social media to enable a designated virtual team which itself supports social media communication. So you had a social media using enabled team for the purpose of getting out social media eventually to the public. They call it a VOST, I wrote that down, Virtual Operations Software Team. And uh, this is something that was an innovation of this event. And then they also, uh, the VOST concept integrates trusted agents into the EM operations. So in other words, you have people that are trustworthy, because that's one of the biggest issues with social media, is do you have any faith in the information that's coming across your Facebook or your Twitter? And frankly, if you're skeptical, you should be. So the, so the big challenge is establishing that trust. And. Uh, couple more points from this report. Like I say, it's really, it's as long as only a professor could write it. Uh, they had uh, multi-point objective task assignments. I call that a concept of operations, that this virtual team, this social media team established ahead of time, so they were not working in an ad hoc way. And it said they used Twitter to direct people to do information as it became available and using embedded links. And there's a blog called or Fire Info. Uh, dot something or other, probably dot org, and that was their main catch point for sending out information to the public, and in that blog was all the other streams embedded. So there's an integration of the social media in some cogent way that makes sense to the people looking at it, who, if you're in the middle of a 10,000 acre fire, you probably don't have a lot of time to check everything. And then uh, 
they also used it to quell problems. Uh, they found a blog by a guy who was unhappy because some fire vehicles went over his private bridge and started to crack it. And so he was uh, threatening to cause all kinds of mayhem and problems using his social media. And they were able to mobilize and do the apology and prop up the bridge and so forth. And they also used Skype. Uh, they also used QR codes. So that's really the latest thing. They printed cards from the emergency management team and put QR codes on the back of all the cards. And those QR codes led to the official information. Again, another way of building in trust. And uh, so there's a lot of other information in there. But here, very quickly, the lessons that I see for social media in emergencies are this. First of all, there's a big gap between expectations of social media and the human capacity to fulfill those expectations. And that's a gap between the capacity of the media and the ability to use it, and also between the porousness of access and the need for trustworthiness of information. Anybody can get on these things, but, and that's the problem, anybody can get on them, unlike trusted radio signals or broadcast. You know, I work in a locked studio where there's a guard, and so does WTOP, because you can't just barge in there and take over the airwaves, uh, you know, under FCC rules. Um, there's a need to graft what I call unstructured processes to the official processes, because a lot of this work in social media is unstructured, yet emergency management, state, local, federal government have well-developed formal processes. so you have to integrate those two sets of processes in some way that's accountable. Uh, you need to solve the liability issues because of information and what people perceive from it, or if you crack somebody's bridge with your fire truck. Uh, how does a small team scale? This, this uh, fire response was conducted by four people. But what if you have a regional event? Or what if you have a multi-city event, like we did in 9-11? How do you scale up these small teams so that they're still effective, maybe across geography, or just for sheer mass scale? Um, what is the utility of this for people who don't use social media or might be suspicious of it? Yesterday there was a horrible tornado. And just two anecdotes from that. This is Associated Press. Uh, a gentleman who saw this happening raced through the darkness in his pickup truck to his parents' house. Unfortunately, they were killed in this tornado. But this is the Paul Revere mode of notifying. He was driving his pickup truck through the dark. And then there's another person across the street from there uh, said she was rousted. Amanda Patrick was rousted by the sirens, the sirens, about five minutes before they hit. They still make sirens. Google it. There's some great sound effects on the web. But so that's another medium that is. Uh, for people that may not be able to get up in the middle of the night to check their Twitter feed. And finally, uh, social media does need a plan, uh, really two plans. You need a plan for communication among that team, and you need communication with the public. Basically, it needs adult supervision. And the final takeaway from this is that it is the function of the public information officers really to do this, and not the emergency workers themselves. Uh, if you, gave, you can't give this to firefighters, if nothing else, their iPhones would melt. So that's my take. Okay. Thank you. Those, that's, that's very interesting. And I do want to have the opportunity to, to have some discussion around those, as I'm sure we will. Uh, I'm Alex Joel. I'm the Civil Liberties Protection Officer for the Director of National Intelligence. I very much appreciate the opportunity to come before you uh, today to talk on this important topic. Um, just a little bit about the background of uh, who I am and my position. Um, the Civil Liberties Protection Officer position was created by the same statute that created the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. That's the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act of 2004. I've occupied this position since stand-up, and our duties include uh, making sure that the policies and procedures of intelligence community elements contain protections for pr privacy and civil liberties, and also to ensure that technologies sustain and do not erode privacy protection. So you can see that social media is something that we are particularly keen on looking at from uh, the intelligence community perspective in terms of how we address the twin uh, mandates of protecting the country from national security from a national security perspective as well as protecting privacy and civil liberties as we do that. Um, this idea of having to do both is also embedded in other core documents that we have in our intelligence agencies. The National Intelligence Strategy of 2009 is an example. It calls, it lays out a vision for the entire intelligence community calling on the intelligence community to be integrated and agile, but also calling on us to exemplify America's values and to uh, protect privacy and civil liberties as we conduct our intelligence missions. Uh, and you know, when I think about that, I start with the Constitution. We we're just having a discussion here before we start on the Constitution. I point out that I carry the Constitution with me 
wherever I go, we actually hand out the Constitution to our folks on Constitution Day. And I was just pointing out that even though it's, it's rather simply written, it's, it's not that easy to understand sometimes when you actually read, sit down and read through the text of the Constitution. But it is the, uh, our oath to the Constitution that we always start with in, when we're government officials of any type. We take an oath when we start our government service, and it is to support and defend the Constitution. And you look at the preamble, and that's easy to understand. The preamble says that we are here to provide for the common defense as well as to secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity. So right there we have this mandate to do both set forth in the preamble. And then of course you get into the Bill of Rights and you talk about freedom of speech, freedom of religion, uh, freedom from unreasonable searches and seizures, and the Equal Protection Clause. And then you think about how those pr principles apply in something like social media. How when you have different forms of technological change uh, coming into play uh, for an intelligence activity, how do you stay true to those principles that we are sworn to support and defend when technological change happens so rapidly? Uh, we have what I call a civil liberties protection infrastructure, and let me just explain that a little bit because I think it helps conceptualize what we're trying to do here. Uh, we have rules, so we have a civil liberties protection infrastructure within the intelligence community itself, but also across the federal government. It consists of rules that are founded on the Constitution, but also, of course, we have multiple statutes that we have to take into account. We have policies, we have procedures. These are interpreted and applied by lawyers, a lot of lawyers in the federal government. Uh, we have offices of Inspector General. We have other oversight offices. We have civil liberties and privacy offices now. Uh, in, in various places in the federal government. We have oversight boards. We have the newly nominated Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, not yet uh, stood up, but it has been nominated by, president, by the president. Um, so, and of course, we have congressional oversight and we have judicial supervision for certain activities that require that. So there's a lot of different overlapping structures. It's been criticized for being a bit complicated. It is complicated, but it, it is there and it is taken very seriously by, by the people involved. I think of that, it's helpful to think of that as a, as a sort of a physical structure. And then you have these different pressure points on that structure brought upon by change. The change is itself unpredictable, but it's predictable that there will be change. And so how do you, re how do you respond to that change? How do these rules, how do these institutions respond to change? And there's no place that changes more rapidly. I mean, there's different sources of change, right? Threats change over time. We've had cybersecurity threats. We've had the terrorist threat. We've had a, you know, the concern about homegrown terrorist threats. Um, now we have uh, you know, cyber, uh, the cybersecurity threat. There's different kinds of threats. We also have changes in technology, changes in terms of new sources of, of data, changes in ways that we expect our government to organize itself and respond to these threats um, that really are sort of horizontal pressures across structures that have been organized traditionally in a vertical way. So we're, we're organized by department and agency sort of vertically across the government, and now we're being told correctly that we have to be, think of ourselves in a, in a more horizontal manner, share information um, across departments and agencies, integrate ourselves better so that we can uh, better respond and serve the American people. So those are different pressure points. Changes in technology, again, I think ch changes in technology, uh, it's hard to predict what the ne that next change will be, but it's predictable that there will be a change. And so we have to think about how do you respond to those changes of technology? Social media is just one aspect of that change. It's just another, it's the next new thing. It's what we're currently dealing with. There have been prior changes. There will be future changes. If you go back to the 1970s, um, when the church committee had its hearings, and those of you, some of you in the room will remember the church committee looking at the intelligence uh, abuses of that era, um, they had this to say about technology. In an era where the technological capability of government relentlessly increases, we must be wary about the drift toward big brother government. The potential for abuse is awesome and requires special attention. Uh, more recently, the WMD committee talked about advanced technology and its creative application remain a comparative advantage for the United States, but we fear that the intelligence community is not adequately leveraging this advantage. So we have something very traditional for the government. On the one hand, there's concern that there's this new technological capability. Are we taking uh, are we going to abuse it in the federal government sector? On the other hand, we're concerned that the government is lagging. It's not taking full advantage of the new technology and, and we're not going to, uh, we're gonna be left behind and we're uh, gonna, there, there's a problem will result. So um, there are uh, ways to address both. I think we can do both and we're gonna get into that discussion. I'll provide some more specifics about the kinds of guidance that we 
that we, we do offer for our professionals and in, in how do you glean intelligence from uh, sources of information that are publicly available uh, so that we can get ahead of uh, crises and prepare for them. Um, I will say this, uh, it's an interesting um, thing to think about. Government, the government folks that I deal with sometimes ask, well, if it's public, how can it be private? It's public, it's, out, it's publicly available. Why are you saying that this is also private? Whereas I think people on the public sites are among the things that they worry about are um, if I think it's private, is the government going to think it's public? You know, how am I reassured that what I consider to be private is going to be treated as private by the government? So there's, there's sometimes a mismatch in those kinds of expectations. There are ways of dealing with those uh, issues. The government spends a great deal of time and effort trying to get it right so that we can both accomplish the mission of uh, providing for public safety and national security while also protecting privacy and civil liberties. Again, there's multiple layers and, and ways of doing that, and we're going to talk about some of those. Very good. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start some kind of jump ball questions here. Uh, David Kaufman, who is the Director of Policy Analysis at FEMA, uh, was in a public forum recently, and, and he said that people's decisions in crisis are inherently social. The average person checks with four or five other people before deciding what to do under an emergency or mandatory evacuation order. If you don't believe me, look around the next time you're in a building when the fire alarm goes off. <laughs> well, that's a social media issue for us as well, although the vetting process between uh, somebody who's in a, in a building and the fire alarm is, is a lot easier to, to understand than the vetting process between what you just got across your Twitter feed. So one of the questions we have, I think, to place in the front of the panel today is what really drives this need to check with others and, and how does it affect the way we're going to use social media in crisis situations from an emergency management perspective? And I want to offer that up to Chris first here. Well, I mean, I think the underlying reason is the same thing else. Is you get that piece of information, which is the fire alarm ringing, you want to know, well, is it real? And I think the, the social media sort of plays in this. If I see FEMA, DHS, a local state emergency manager agency tweet something that says, hey, you know, the mandatory evacuations have been issued for this area. And the first thing you're going to do is you're going to, you know, you're going to follow up with someone. You're not going to follow up with that agency. You're going to follow up with your friend. But the social aspect of it, if I see, if I don't follow, you know, FEMA on Twitter, but if I see my friend is retweeting FEMA, he's basically, my friend is endorsing this message. So when you have the combination of you know, a government and authority saying something, and oh, by the way, my friend thinks this is serious. My friend perceives this threat as being real. My friend is saying FEMA, or you know, FEMA doesn't tell people to evacuate, but if you know, a state emergency management agency says, hey, you should evacuate, the hurricane's coming, and my friend who lives you know, down the block from me or lives in the town over says, on Twitter, retweets it and says, hey, you know, the state of EMA is saying you should evacuate. I'm like, well, okay, if the state's saying it and my friend down the street's saying it, you know, that's where it lends the credibility and sort of endorses that message. Okay. Um, Tom, do you? Any, you know, you, you deal with the media side of this, Tom. Um, how do you, and I'm sure that you all see and watch these things happening. Uh, well, I think the question that people have uh, and the reason they check with others, I don't think in the average even the extraordinary situation, unless it's an extreme situation, I don't think the average person is worried that they're going to lose their life. I don't think you ever actually feel you're going to get killed unless you, the most extreme, even if the ship is listing or whatever. I think people worry about their stuff. And the reason they don't want to leave their homes, or even their offices or hotels, is because all the stuff is behind. And so if the authorities communicating could assure people that areas would be secured by law enforcement, I think maybe that model might change. So that goes to this whole behavioral model question. Uh, how is it that the federal government, in coordination with state and local emergency response, can build that level of expectation and expectation management into the equation so that it's done when things are normal, not when they're abnormal? You all had a chance to, to look at ways that that might uh, that might have might get supported, Chris. Um, I guess there are a few. I mean, the sort of backing up a little bit. There, you need to establish these relationships of trust before something happens. Um, 
unless unless you have again the the third party validator, whether again it's a friend or maybe it's maybe it's you know Tom who's a, a journalist saying this is important, what the government is saying important. But I think it all sort of goes back to the behavioral. You know, no matter what piece of information you're communicating with someone, the public's going to look for validation of that message. And I think we operate on the assumption because even even people living in Florida who have gone through you know a dozen hurricanes, you know, still don't you know want to evacuate. And still the, the model is oh they told us to evacuate you know three days ago or you know, they say to evacuate tomorrow. We're going to wait another day because the highways are going to be crowded. And because they all you know we the government always builds in you know a 24 hour buffer or something like that. But you know. The public sort of assumes that because we've sort of, you know, it's, it's sort of the, the a circular sort of thing. But if, again, I think that what social sort of brings to the game is, again, that validation of a message, the validation of a message by someone either I trust and know personally validating it or someone like Tom who is sort of a trusted, you know, he's a journalist, he's someone trusted in the community, whether it's, you know, Tom or whether it's CNN or, you know, you always need different people validating each other. And I think social, social media makes it easy for that to happen. Because you know, if I see again, you know, or you know, you can even be the other way around. I could I could be sharing you know, Tom's tweet to my friends because you know Tom says this is important. I well, you know, I, I know Tom now. I think Tom knows what he's talking about. So I'm going to tell my friends, hey, you know, listen to Tom. So I think that sort of validation, and we're sort of what we look at, at DHS is the behavioral model of, you know, that works in our favor, and that sometimes also works against us, which is when it comes in sort of the. When something is is perceived to be true, because someone now the third party is is spreading the information, but not there, there's you know the journalist isn't validating it and the government isn't validating it. So eventually that piece of information will die. That sort of started as a rumor, but right now until that happens, so that's sort of down the, the track. Tom, from a from a media perspective, can you talk a little bit about how you all vet this kind of stuff? I mean, what what's the policy of a of a radio program? With respect to information sources that you guys validate and, and trust at the level of what Chris was just talking about. Well, I can give you a real low level example, and that's school closings, which is a big issue, you know, anywhere there's snow. And uh, I know that at WTOP, they have private numbers and certain trusted individuals. <coughs> They're the only ones that know it, so that anyone can't call up and say, schools are closed. And so there are there are tunnels, you know, virtual, I guess you'd call it a virtual private network if it was, if it was technical. And then uh, we have, uh, but there's no tried and true way of saying something is trustworthy except uh, that, uh, you know, the news feeds that you trust. For example, I, I quoted something from the Associated Press. Well, I, you know, I know them and I know that's a trusted source of information. But I think the real question you might be asking is if you look at any medium today, there is more and more so-called Sometimes it's citizen journalism, or sometimes it's here, post your pictures here. And that's where I think you get into slippery territory. And maybe that makes, you know, 35 years in journalism, maybe I'm old school that, well, I am. I'll just say that I am. Uh, because I think that any more than citizen policemen or citizen firemen, yes, people want to help and they can contribute, but there is so much downside uh, possibility to that. In, 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 one, in one case, in the latter case, safety, in the case of media information, uh, the ability to trust it. And let's face it, even when people are legitimate media people, you can't always trust it either. <laughs> so we have a long history of, of developing sources uh, in that they can be, that doesn't, it can be individuals, they can be other organizations, and they can be locations that are known to be trustworthy over time. So there's no, there's no magic to it, but it's just a matter of developing trust over time. And the, and the problem with social media and input this way is you, you can't always believe it. So that goes back to where, uh, where Chris was with trying to set expectations in the community. So yeah. That's right. And I mean, part of it is, you know, as these networks mature, whether we talk about Twitter or Facebook or what, what is it, what is, what's going to come down the pipe, you know, Twitter has started verifying accounts, um, which is verified that the accounts are who they say they are. So if you go to the DHS Twitter feed or the FEMA Twitter feed or, you know, any of those or, you know, some, a lot of journalists are getting them where it's you get a little badge and say this is verified. Twitter has determined that this person is actually who they claim to be. That's sort of a small part, but that doesn't sort of deal with the problem of you know, at, at DHS and the government. You know, we don't push out information that we, you know, we don't sort of get caught up in that. It's like you know, if we wouldn't say this in a press release or in front of a podium, we're not going to tweet it. And I, I think that sometimes you know, not to knock on journalists, but 
the, the sort of... Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I'm used these, to it. These sort of, you know, as, as so the lesser journalistic publications, want, everyone wants to have a scoop. So now, in some publications, a source can be a person on Twitter. Like someone on, you know... Right. And you see the bar across the bottom, the source, you know, colon, X happened. And what's the definition of source? Like, oh, you know, we, we got false information on Twitter. Like, someone tweeted something. Now, often you, you know, it, I like to look back actually at the Bin Laden example when the news of Bin Laden dying had, uh, was starting to leak out. There were a lot of people saying it, but the news media knew, well, you know, that's just speculation. But then they saw, you know, the chief of staff to uh, Secretary Rumsfeld, I believe, right. tweeted, hey, I'm hearing from my sources. And that he, you know, we had only like 300 Twitter followers, but 300 very influential Twitter followers and 300 people who really knew him and said, you know, they knew that he wouldn't be spreading pure rumor. Mm -hmm. So part of it is still the very sort of social nature of, I know when you know, X calls me, you know, that person tends to like trade in rumor, while I know if this person tells me, you know, he, he doesn't play that way. So I think you sort of exceed some of that sort of expanding the social. Because I, I know I, I, don't, you know, I don't spread rumors on Twitter, and my friends who know me, either whether it's virtually based on my record of interacting with them or just know me as you know, a person I know in real life, they know I wouldn't do that. So there is those sort of informal communities of trust that sort of build up. And I think you can, that sort of, that's the bad information. Now, time and again, you see that sort of spiraling out of control, which I think the media is getting better about it, about saying, hey, you know, this report of someone dying, let's, let's call their publicist, let's call their, you know, their POC before we run with it. Well, I think you know, a year ago, everyone got caught in this. You know, I, I don't have the particular example, but like this following celebrity has died, and people were like, they were running with a source to say, and they're like, completely false. <laughs> That's right. I mean, we have a motto, and it's nothing unique to us, and that is, get it right, then get it first. Right. And, it, and nowadays, with the instant news it and all the Twitter, it. yeah, it, it doesn't really matter where you hear it first. I mean, my personal interest is what really happened, and I'm, I'm content to find out the full story the next day. You know, if I'm not on the air until the next morning, I want to make sure I know I can give some perspective and analysis to it, because there's 10,000 places you can go to get the facts as they happen. If I could just jump in, I think uh, this discussion illustrates one of the underlying uh, principles that I believe in in terms of how do you address technological change. I mean, so what, what I think we're hearing in both in terms of how people behave in a crisis, the, the need to sort of validate with their social networks um, and uh, in terms of looking at who that source is, is it a trusted source of information? You're sort of reflecting how, how human beings behave and then, and then you're applying that behavior to a new change in technology, in this case it's social media. And now social media is allowing us to display that behavior in a new way. It's still human beings behaving as they have in the past, but now we have this new technological capability that allows us to do things in a new and different way. And from my perspective as, as someone who focused on privacy matters and civil liberties matters, the question then becomes, do you change your rules or to, uh, to adjust to this new change in technology, or really is, are we talking about human beings just enabled to do things perhaps on a broader stage and more instant, instantaneously without the, without the necessary forethought, but still the same principles ought to apply in those new situations. And I think that's true in a lot of different settings, news valid, validating news sources, how people behave in crises. Really, people are, are the same. Human nature is fairly immutable over time, and um, we're just having to deal with that nat human nature being expressed through different technological capabilities that we now have. Okay. You know, one of the things, too, that I think we also can touch on is, is social networking services have, have offer, offer up a, a different kind of dynamic from the standpoint of being able to pre be predictive about the nature of things that are going on. And in crisis management, situational awareness, and, and in particular in intelligence processing, that seems to be something that people are starting to exploit. Um, some of the indicators that you see through that particular mechanism at the transactional level are really too small to actually be able to detect some particular activity. So it's really a group of activities that you start to monitor against. So what I'd like to do, Alex, is, is shift to the front of the queue a little bit and talk a little bit about how you prepare for a crisis, um, how the government uses social media currently today or what the near-term plans are to get ahead of a crisis, and kind of from an intelligence perspective, 
How do you do that and still preserve these privacy and civil liberties you were just discussing? Well, I can sort of talk about this in general terms. Um, I think the, the, along the lines of, of everything we've been saying right now, to the extent that people are using social media to communicate, um, well, let me, let, me, let me tackle this through an analogy. So uh, people may be familiar with something called the Foreign Broadcast Information Service. This was um, the name of a service that was uh, offered um, to a lot of uh, government customers. Uh, it was a, a group of specialists, a group of specialists in the federal government that focused on foreign broadcasts. And these broadcasts were coming out of, you know, countries behind the Iron Curtain. And um, it was government broadcasts uh, about, uh, you know, particular you know, uh, political or uh, government-related developments. And they would translate these broadcasts. Um, so he had specialized uh, analysts focusing on these broadcasts of clearly foreign government interest, and they would translate them and provide them to policymakers. And really, I think it brought, some of these were made broadly publicly available as well. Um, and that was back in the old days. That was the traditional model. Um, and now you have a new model where you have I information of interest potentially to a lot, broad set of consumers that's being posted not just by um, specialized media, but also by everybody. So you have multiple people who can post almost anything. Um, it's multiple broadcasters. The content is potentially of interest to uh, policymakers and potentially of no interest. Much of it is of no interest whatsoever to policymakers, but it's hard to tell. Um, and um, and there are you don't need a specialized group of folks, you know, tuning in to particular radio frequencies to, to capture these broadcasts. Anybody can capture, can, can, look up, can look them up from their desktop on the internet. In fact, in many cases, you know, some government folks feel they have an easier ability to do that from home than they do from work. You know, they can just sort of, uh, like anybody else uh, in, in the country, Google or look up on YouTube or, or, or do, do any, join any social networking service and see any of this stuff themselves. It's all publicly available. Um, or it, not all of it is. We, we caution you have to make sure that it is in fact publicly available before you can look at it. So to the extent that this huge explosion of information is going on, um, there may be information out there that could tell you something of interest that's going on in, of current events, of current interest to policymakers or to first responders. You know, is there something that we are seeing that could tell you that, that there is a disease outbreak? Is there something that tells you that there's a shift of uh, of, uh, of government, uh, you know, in a particular part of the world. I don't have to you know, bring up the more, more obvious examples of that. And so, uh, you can look at these kind, all sources of information for that kind of um, that kind of intelligence. Now, the question is, you know, what principles ought to apply from a privacy and civil liberties perspective? And the number one thing that we always tell people, and this applies across the government, not, not just in the intelligence community, but is is you have to stay true to your mission. You know, is it your mission, is it your agency's mission, and is it your organization within your agency's mission to do this? And that is protective of civil liberties and privacy. Um, your agency has been given a particular mission. If it's first responders, then you, you have a particular uh, responsibility and focus. You've been given training, you've been given guidance on how to carry out that mission, and therefore anything you do with respect to uh, this kind of activity has to be related to your mission, even if it is publicly available. The second thing that we always focus people on is to make sure that it's publicly available. It has to, in fact, be publicly available. Now, sometimes it's hard to tell when you're on, on social networking. Uh, we know that people's privacy settings may change unexpectedly and things like that. But you have to make sure that, in fact, this information is intended to be publicly available. And so that's the guidance that we give. Um, available to any member of the public. Um, let me just remind myself of the other things that we sort of say generally. Uh, First Amendment uh, is another big issue. Uh, even if it is publicly available, um, we shouldn't be monitoring somebody solely on the basis of First Amendment protected speech. So you're free to say anything that you want. Uh, if you, you say it on the town square, you can say it on the internet. And just because you say something that's unpopular or critical of government policies doesn't mean that the government should be monitoring that speech. There has to be a valid reason for looking at something um, and it should not be because they want to monitor First Amendment speech. It also should not be because they want to monitor someone based on a particular race or ethnicity uh, alone. Um, that's, not, that's not the reason for monitoring somebody. Um, there are, we have specific rules. So if you're looking at uh, any personal identifiable information of anybody, 
Different agencies are going to have different, very specific restrictions about your ability to do that, even if it is publicly available. Sometimes you may not be able to do that at all. Sometimes you can only do that within certain particular categories. In any event, you're going to have to comply with the Privacy Act, and you're also going to have to comply, if you're in the intelligence community, with our executive order, which is 12333, which governs how you can collect, retain, and disseminate information about United States persons. And then we also talk about accuracy. We, we want to make sure that people understand, of course they do, and this is what we've talked about here, that information on, you know, in the publicly available information such as that that might be available on the internet is, has to be vetted for accuracy and has to align with your agency standards for accuracy. And different agencies um, will have different standards. The intelligence community has its analytic standards, which call for objectivity. Uh, looking at all sources of information and verification for accuracy. And just because it's on Wikipedia doesn't mean it's true, you know, uh, although sure. Stephen Colbert calls it wiki, wikiality, right? So uh, it, it's got truthiness to it, um, but it doesn't mean that it's objective reality. Um, so those are the kinds of things we talk to our folks about when, when looking at publicly available information. And one of the, the other questions, Alex, I think this poses for people is how you look at this kind of precursor information in, against the backdrop you've just painted for us. And you start to tease out or pick out the fact that there's something a little more sinister behind what looks like an emergency event. Uh, it could be a bioterrorism attack. It could, be, um, it could be something that's masking another series of activities. And how do you do the changeover here between things that are open source and protected the way you've just described and those things that now move to a law enforcement domain and need to be considered, you know, you have to, be, you have, to have attribution, you need to be able to, to start the collection process on something that appears to be criminal in nature. How, how's the, how's the, how do you transition those things? So. Um for us, it's fairly easy. We have the FBI, and the FBI can um, handle that. They have uh, attorney general guidelines which provide for them to uh, make that transition. Those, those, are, those uh, guidelines went through um, revision in 2008 and provide for how to do that. So they have um, um, guidance specifically on how do they deal with online activities, how do they deal with publicly available information, and then what, what do they need to initiate um, an assessment, a preliminary investigation, and a full investigation, and gives them guidance on the different techniques that they can use. So it would be something that would be referred to the FBI. And then the FBI, in turn, would have its, its own capabilities of um, uh, dealing with local law enforcement to the extent that's necessary. So from my perspective, that would be what, what would happen. In general, I think, the, the broader question is, you know, once when, when something gets into a more specific realm from, an, um, from, a law, from a criminal, potential criminal event, you do kick it over into a law enforcement uh, standpoint, no matter if you're in state and local or in the federal government. Um, and then, then different agencies have their specific authorities and specific um, guidelines that they have to follow, including um, the laws that, that apply to law enforcement investigations, and they're going to be particularly focused in many cases on ensuring that they, whatever they collect can be used in a criminal trial. And so they're going to be very careful about how they proceed in that sense. Yet the information set that they're picking from is this same domain of open source material that's in constant flow between people in the community and uh, the crisis management activities or the others that are in this dialogue. So sorting through this stuff and pulling it out from an indications and warnings perspective and then looking at it from a law enforcement perspective is creating this, this interesting kind of conundrum, I think, for people to have to deal with. Not driven so much by the, la the, the policy, because I think that's in play. It's the sheer magnitude of the amount of data that you have to manage and having the tools at the right place at the right time to be able to focus on these kinds of things. So how do you think this new environment um, from a data management perspective and the fact that it's now kind of bi-directional uh, is affecting the way uh, the, the ODNI folks are looking at the problem and the way, from what your experience would suggest, how the FBI looks at this collections issue. Um, once, so if you're asking me about, if the question is more from an information sharing perspective. Right. Um, so once, once information 
has been lawfully collected, then each agency will have the ability to um, share that information according to its authorities. So, for example, the FBI has sharing relationships and arrangements in place um, with different agencies that it normally deals with, and then um, if a particular need for sharing takes place, they put in place the they implement that sharing arrangement that they have with those particular agencies. We're working to, um, you know, in the DNI across the intelligence community and then between the intelligence community and non-intelligence community elements to further smooth those relationships out and better integrate um, the sharing arrangements so that the sharing can happen uh, more quickly, um, recognizing, though, that because agencies have different authorities and the information comes from different sources, uh, you do have to match up um, the protections that would apply to the data. So it, it is not going to happen, um, I guess it doesn't happen, it's not as if there's a big database that's being created in the sky that all federal and state and local agencies are, are, um, are able to access. That is not the model and that's not what's happening. Instead, you have a series of um, relationships that have to be put in place or are in place that take into account the different uh, authorities that each agency operates under and that try to account for the way that the data has to be handled as it goes from one agency to the next. So it's not as um, you know simple as one might hope for if one were shooting just for a pure seamless sharing situation. On the other hand, I think it is an appropriate way to both share and protect information. One of the things about that, I guess, that's also uh, certainly on my mind and others in the audience, too, is how do you move fast enough to deal with these changes? I mean, how do you deal with uh, the explosion in Twitter and uh, Facebook and these other social media interchange points uh, with a pretty complicated policy model? I mean, what, what you've just described is, is great strides forward, but it's still a pretty complicated policy interchange. So I, I don't want to take up all the speaking time, so let's you know, see what other folks response. want to say as well on this one. But um, my own personal view, I've already sort of um, uh, foreshadowed it, is I, I, I feel like um, whenever technological change is predictable, the fact that it's going to change is predictable, but we don't know what the next change will be. And I, I feel that the better overall approach to dealing with technological change is to try to, um, as, long as, our, as, as long as our existing principles are not tied to a particular technology, if you have technologically neutral principles, then the way to do, deal with it is to try to apply those principles to the next version of technological change, either by reasoning by analogy or whatever. But you, you, you apply those principles and you provide guidance to people tailored to whatever that technological change is. But I, I, I try to resist the temptation of rewriting the rules that we're operating under from scratch to deal with, for example, social media. Because by the time we get those rules down and write them up through the careful government processes that we have and, and maybe even going to Congress if we have to because of some laws that we have to deal with, um, the next new thing will be upon us. And um, not only will the technolo technology have jumped ahead so that we're dealing with rules now, now that the, new, the rules that we have are outdated, but I'm not confident that we'll have gotten those rules exactly right anyway because we may not have understood fully the implications of the technology that we were writing those rules for at the time we were writing them. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm an advocate of trying to apply the principles we have to the changes that we're dealing with. Yeah, I, I'd just like to comment. I think Alex has it exactly right. Paul Strassman, the former DOD I guess you could call them the CIO, 20 years ago would say that as long as you have sound policy, you can deal with the implications of technology. And those were the days when the government was wondering if it could ever get to six cents a minute on dial-up telephone service. But the uh, two things are looming, uh, looming that I see that play out from what Alex is saying. Well, there's three things. One is the big data question, and you've, we've, that's been discussed ad nauseum. That's easily solvable you know, with technological tools. But the government is going to be facing, I think, temptations and capabilities that it will be tempted to use that will have to be tempered by policy uh, that are looming ahead of us. One issue I see is the critical infrastructure question. There's a bill in Congress now, and we don't know what Homeland Security's role will be with respect to the cybersecurity of critical infrastructure. It's still very much debating. There's a second bill coming out today that's going to 
being thrown at that cannonball, and, and it could come out anywhere. But there is a lot of information being amassed in those critical infrastructures. And so if the cybersecurity rules say they have to be a certain way, someday there's regulation, you know, what, what can government do, if anything, to access that data for law enforcement, for emergency management, for national security, or for defense purposes? We don't know. Uh, and the other area coming up is I want to talk about Google. Today is the day that Google's privacy policy is revised. Frankly, if you read it carefully, and I've spoken to people from Google about this, the reality of it is actually a little bit less than the, than the uh, information and the news and the, and the hand-wringing about it. But they basically have about 20 different services you can use in Google, and you sign in with a common account. Basically, they're going to follow your habits across your accounts and aggregate that information in a way that it is actionable in terms of tailoring advertising to you. And that's the trade-off. And by the way, if you're a federal agency signing up for Google services, none of that applies. It's a different, totally different contract situation. So this is personal. But the day will come that something will happen, and uh, a perpetrator will be found uh, that uh, has a Google account. And so that Google account could conceivably give rise to a lot of connections, one of those spider web charts that could expose other things. You know, who else was with the Oklahoma City? You know, we, and, and so what right will government have to that? Is it just a simple matter of a subpoena? Or is there some other policy that we're going to need? And so I think ultimately we're still going to have to rely on the framework of discretion by public officials and yet having enough flexibility to be effective in bad situations and all that tempered under, you know, as Alex says, ultimately the Constitution. But yes, the technology will make these questions somewhat, well, not somewhat, exponentially more difficult, but the policy framework I think that we have in place is going to really be tested. Let's shift back to a little bit more specifics, Chris. Um, you know, there's a recent Pew Research Center study that was conducted in 2010 that said that about 42% of the adult, U.S. adult population was using a social networking service. That was up from 27% in 2008. And the survey suggests that there's about 155 million Facebook users and about 25 million Twitter users in the U.S. So when we take that and we, and we overlay that on top of the crisis information management perspective, um, what's DHS and, 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 you, and by outreach, what are the state and local communities doing to deal with this and, and make sure that there's timely and localized information management activities that, that focus on, on emergency response? Okay. Um, well, there are a few things. If think about first, with the, one of the fallacies with a lot of the way social media works today is you have one account and everyone in that account gets everything you put out. So DHS or FEMA or any, any sort of national organization can't put tailored information out necessarily because you're not going to care about 99% of the public doesn't care about a tornado warning in Kansas. So really the onus on that side is, you know, that city, that county, that state, you know, you sort of need to have that sort of, you know, almost a pyramid of information where the local puts out their information. If it's actionable for the county, the county would put it out, and then the state would put it out, and then the federal government put it out. Now, that only works if everyone is you know, signed up for those accounts. So I think the real onus on all that is you know, starting up front, and don't, don't launch your Twitter account when the tornado is coming or when the hurricane is coming. You, know, you should have a Twitter account always. You should always be promoting it. But you also need to set the expectation, both internally to your organization and to the public, of you know, this account is going to provide critical information. You should follow it, you should like it, you know, whatever the platform is. We shouldn't use it to push out our press release about, you know, the fair day maybe, right? Because you've created, you know, unless that's what you create the expectation. This is a general news feed from the city where you'll know when the Parks and Rec Department is open and when, you know, all that stuff. And that's great to push crisis information there, but really you should have platforms and accounts and places where people can go. They know they're only going to get critical information. Because the first thing someone's going to do, and, you know, we heard complaints about this was, you know, told us to follow FEMA and DHS during Hurricane Irene, and now next week you're pushing out a blog post about cybersecurity. Okay, that's a fair, you know, it's a fair complaint. Like, well, you, you know, you set an expectation that this is about critical information, you know, the status of the cybersecurity legislation, not really critical information for me who signed up when the hurricane was coming down, and I wanted to know if shelters were open and stuff like that. So I think, you know, 
emergency management really needs to look at, you know, what, why are you doing it, and what's the expectation you're setting with public, and really work on a front end. You can't just set it up when it's happening. Um, and that's, I mean, again, how we responded to localization of it. It's the low, everyone needs to be doing it, you know, and whether it's emergency management or law enforcement. Yeah, the whole community policing concept, there's no reason that your, your beat cop can't also have a Twitter account where you're, you can, you know, see what the beat cop is saying. As you might say, you know, when you see him, you know, you're sitting on your stoop and he comes by and says hi to you. So sort of taking those offline structures and connections and just putting them online is a lot of, I think, what we can be doing. When you all look at the public uh, discussion about see something and say something, right. I mean, that's a very, that's, it's really a, a, a push activity by DHS right. to encourage public participation. How's the social media interface on see something, say something, reacting for you all? So, I, I mean, I think that's still developing because right now it's really, we want to get the message out. Because see something, say something is not see something called DHS, it's see something and say something to local authorities, right? Right. So, right now, and I mean, for those of you familiar with the see something, say something campaign and the whole suspicious activity reporting initiatives, there isn't a nationalized system necessarily because there's no 800 number you can call at DHS where we're going to route them to your local police. Well, we, it's more of a sort of, it's more of a message that says, if you see this and it doesn't look right, you know, tell your local authorities. So right now for social media, it's really just pushing. There's no, there's no way of, you know, taking all that, especially at a national level and, and turning it into something actionable. Have you all seen any response or any indicators that suggest that that campaign is having an impact at the, at the local level? I, I think it really are, because when you, if you look at sort of anecdotally, you look at, you know, whether it was the Times Square incident where the, the street vendor, you know, the first thing he said to the reporter is like, well, you know, like, why did you decide to report the smoking car? It's like, well, you always hear, if you see something, you should say something, right? So it's, it's more, it's less sort of a direct you know, action and more of a sort of, you know, if I see something that doesn't look right, the immediate thing comes to mind, like, oh, I saw those posters. They always tell me to see something and say something. So I'm going to tell, you know, the mall cop or I'm going to tell, you know, I'm going to tell someone. So, you know, anecdotally, we've seen that. Um, you know, it's hard with any sort of, I would call, you know, sort of outreach campaign. They're really, you know, which, you know, they're always survey, you know, we can't do surveys, but, you know, even in the private sector, people always do surveys, like, how did you find our product and service? Right. You know, check the box. But, you know, that doesn't really, it's really hard. Most people don't even know why they are doing something. They don't remember the first poster they saw that was most effective. They just remember, oh, you know what? People always say, see something, say something, so I'm going to do that. So on the macro level, we're seeing it through anecdotal examples, but I, you know, there are no numbers or anything to back that up. Okay. Um, we have a question from the audience, Chris, I also wanted to, to foot to you. It's um, if you have a, any uh, thoughts on what social media best practices DHS is using right now. I think there's just some general ones for maybe someone or an organization that isn't doing it right now, which is first thing, but it does, is a reason for us to do it. Why are we doing it? Going back to the expectation setting, you know, wh why should I follow, like, sign up for your account? And then manage those expectations both internally and externally. And when, you know, the senior leader comes to you and said, we should put this out on Twitter. And you're like, well, you know, this is very interesting to us and our organization, but our audience expects, you know, actionable information or they expect a certain type of information. So the best practices I would sort of advocate for are expectation setting and then integration. Don't resist the urge to set up a social media stovepipe. Um, there's no reason, as you mentioned earlier, you know, the, the PIO is the one you should be doing. If you, you, know, yep. you should have the person who's providing information to the media and information to, you know, everything else should also know how social media works. Because it's not rocket science, you know. There, you don't have a guy who sits in your office who only operates a fax machine. Or a guy who sits in your office who only operates a telephone. Or someone who only talks to, you know, the radio station, right? Now, in a big organization, you might have that, but if you have, if you only, if you have one PIO, resist the urge to hire a social media guru, which is a term I hate. Like, there's nothing, it's, it's a new channel. It's the same type of information as we spoke earlier. Amen, brother. <laughs> the, the social construct and the, it still play, t plays into it. And it's going back to what um, Alex is saying about policy, I resist the urge to create policy that are based on specific platforms. You see, Oh, we have a Facebook policy, we have a Twitter policy. Well, had you started this five years ago, you would have had a MySpace policy and a Second Life policy, and you would have had a policy about, you know, all these individual platforms, when really they're all the same, and really a lot of what you would do on there is the same as what, you know, your current PIO structure is. You know, just, you're not going to tweet information you wouldn't release otherwise. So if you're going to have a press conference, you should tweet it as well. If you're going to, 
you know, put a press release out, you should really put it on your Facebook page or your website. It's just really figuring out in what part of your organization, you know, who's that person who runs it, but you know, resist the urge to create a big stovepipe of social media. Okay, that's great advice. Um, Tom, for you, this is another one from the audience. Do you see a widening gap in the social media haves and have-nots? From your perspective as a, as a news journalist, do you think that this is a, a technique that's actually reaching these audiences, or are we actually segregating parts of the population now in terms of access to this? That's a tough one. I mean, I think everybody has access. Sometimes we confuse access with affordability in a lot of debates that we're having publicly. Any, anyone can have access to anything. The question, I guess, is, um, and maybe if whoever asked it can clarify it, but uh, are we catering only to people that have social media actively operating versus the great unwashed, if that's the sense of the question? Right. Well, not really, because uh, you know, our broadcast is free, and uh, you know, it's 6 to 10, 1500 AM weekdays. Uh, tune in. <laughs> <laughs> we have iPhone apps and Android apps. And so, uh, it, it, you know, and the newspaper is not very expensive even, even now. So I don't think access to most information is really not there. Uh, almost everybody in the country can, seems to be able to afford a cell phone. And, you know, they just do. You see them, every, everybody has them. Uh, I mean, well, that's all I'm going to say. But so I think that uh, in most media try to cater as deeply as they can within the economic constraints of the medium they have. By that, I mean the newspaper can only afford so many pages a day, and they can only distribute so much. And uh, because it's supported by advertising and there's ratios, we have 24 hours a day of broadcasting. I have four hours a day. And that gives me each hour I have actually about 42 minutes of content. The rest is advertising. So there's a limit. There's a physical limit to the older media. There is no limit to what you can do, you know, virtually no, there's, you know, practically no limit. And so uh, there is more available in any medium on their websites and in Twitter feeds than you get with what's available free or for the traditional low cost. And so, in that sense, we are catering to people that do have access to these things, but without abandoning that which they've always been able to have for free or low cost. Now, there are, you know, there are internet-only media, and if you can't afford a data plan, or you can't afford uh, internet access from a fixed location, then you can't read, I don't know, Slate or something like that. Uh, so. Okay. But Tom, Tom, yeah, there, there are two audiences. I mean, because I, I, I thought that was an interesting question myself. Because I, I, what I wrote down, when, one of the things you cited from that re earlier report was utility to, for people who don't use social media. I don't know if that was the intent of the question, but I wrote that note down because I thought that was interesting. Because there, there's certainly a, a significant segment of the population who just don't use it, and I, I don't know if every, anyone's done studies as to why certain people don't use social media and certain people use social media. But there's a certain group who, you know. Some people don't have, have a life. <laughs> <laughs> who don't, you know, don't have Facebook accounts, who don't, have, don't want one, don't, don't use Twitter, uh, don't have a mobile phone that would enable them to, to access those from, from those sources, and so therefore do get their information from, you know, old school means. So I don't know if that was the intent of the question. And I'd also just add, I think it goes back to the dot-com bubble, sort of, where everyone said, all our problems can be solved by the Internet. You know, I, and now people are saying all our problems can be solved if we just have a Twitter feed or a Facebook feed. And the reality of it is it's just another sort of, it's one of the wedges. And it's one, you know, it has overlap with people listen to radio and people watch TV and people read a newspaper. And there are some people who don't do any of that at all who might just only do social media. But, and, and sort of going back to what we said earlier too as well, a lot of people providing valuable content on social media are traditional media. They are the radio stations. They are the TV networks. They are the reporters. I mean, if you look at the top sort of on Twitter, for instance, the top followed accounts, a lot of them are journalists. Yeah. I mean, CNN, there, it's just another way to push out the same content through another channel, and I think government needs to look at it the same way. It's like, you know, don't get rid of your traditional media outreach. Don't get rid of having press conferences. Don't get rid of doing you know, poster campaigns. Just figure out how it fits in and sort of dedicate some resources to it appropriately. And if you're doing it locally, you know, talk to your community. If you're in a, a small, you know, if you're in a small community, it's really easy for you to figure out, you know what? Half of our community is on this, or 10% of our community is on this. Or maybe our community happens to be 
more on Twitter, or more on Facebook, or they're on neither one, and you look at something like text messaging, you know, setting up basically your own network or your own feed. So I think that really all has to play into it. You have to figure out what audience are you trying to reach and how do you get there. Don't, don't start with the platform and then convince people to be on it if they don't want to be. Well, I think from, a, from an emergency response crisis management perspective, you have to have that whole stack because you don't know how much or how little the infrastructure is actually going to be in play when you go in to try and react to the population when they're, they're yeah. in harm's way. So That's right. It, it becomes a situation, I think, where this, this whole stack, it, it, even though this is kind of a revolutionary change, you still have to be able to evolve between the two and scale back when you have a problem. And you know, Facebook seems to be doing fine now. Is I mean, Facebook going to look the same in five years? No. No. I mean, it might, so, I don't think it's going to be gone, but I think it goes yeah. into the whole, you know, always be looking for what you should be doing. Where, right. where is your audience? And, you know, especially in some communities where, you know, Facebook is not, for instance, the largest Spanish language uh, network in the United States. There, there are, I've, I think Orchid is still larger amongst non-English speakers. So if you have a population you're trying to reach and they happen to be on this, you should be there. Or there's some niche sort of private networks or some, some institutions operate their private networks, which you know, a college, for instance, might still have one. Like, you know, you, if you're a local mortgage manager and you have a, you know, a large college in your town, you know, you should be working with that college to make sure they are, even if you're not operating the space, that they are getting your, your information and are passing along to those networks. Yeah, and I would say I would argue still for the maintenance of the older media. Uh, when I grew up in a town in Massachusetts, they had a fire whistle, and it would blow a pattern, and in the local phone book, you could tell from the pattern of horns where the fire was. And I think that type of communication media actually still has a role even today in, in emergency management, like that person in Ohio where the uh, tornado was heard it by siren. And yeah. sirens can be heard 10 miles away. It's, it's also, it just, I think it's also generational. I mean, my, for, I know that this has been discussed many times, but for those of us who have teenage kids, um, I have a, an 18 year old who's in college now, he's a math science kid, so he doesn't read. He, he also, I don't read. Uh, but he does, so he doesn't read the newspaper, he doesn't follow traditional media, but what he is on Facebook, and so he gets his news from Facebook. Literally his friends will tell him something that's going on, and that's how he, he gets updated on his news. And is he following me, Angela Jolina's leg <laughs> on Twitter? If it's on, if it's on, it if his friends are following it on Facebook, that's a, what he'll tell me about. And uh, so it is, it is in some ways generational. Uh, I think we're going to go ahead and close out the panel if anybody has any final comments. Uh, I really appreciate everybody being here today, and I think this was a very valuable session. I appreciate you.